Yo, welcome to this week's show. My name is Eric Njiro, and today we're talking about how football transfers do work between the time they play scouted to being unveiled at a new club or going on loan. And joining me now from all the way from the UK is none other than Nathan Dean Karioki, who is a football scout at Oxford United in the UK. Nathan, it's good to see you for the first time in my show. Thanks for having me, Eric. I appreciate it. Nice. First of all, like you're a Kenyan, many Kenyans are wondering how to get to the UK and how do you start doing scouting. There are also many people who do this. Yeah, so I, I don't think, I think I might be the only Kenyan scout. I've not met another one yet. Um, yes. But basically, I was in coaching. So I coached um, in the NSL in Kenya, came over here to do my degree and realized maybe my coaching wasn't going to take me to where I wanted it to go. Pivoted into scouting um, and somehow kind of, you know, kind of ended up ended up at Oxford, which is which is great. So I'm in my third season now at the club. Okay. Uh, so it's kind of flown by. <laughs> Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's a good club to be at. So Nathan, please tell us what is the first step of the transfer? So I think viewing kind of player transfers and recruitment, it's don't view it as like step one, step two, step three. It's kind of more like a cycle, right? Okay. You never, recruitment never stops. You just kind of on different stages in, in it. So I think you kind of say it, you have the identifying stage. So it's when you identify the player, then you get to the shortlisting stage so you've identified 100 players you now need to trim it down to 20 and then i'll say like the finalizing stage that's from that 20 you're only going to do one or two of those transfers so that's then the like bringing them in and you know you have them playing for you on the saturday so it's kind of it's more like like a cycle and you know in the identifying stage there's about 100 different processes that lead into that in the shortlisting stage is about 100 different things and the finalizing stage is about 100 different things but kind of broadly it's identifying um, shortlisting and then finalizing, you kind of, kind of view it. Um, so where do the agents now come in? So yeah, so the way it kind of works is like in the, um, you know, identifying stage, you can identify players, you know, through just going to games and you see, okay, that player's good. I should watch him again. You know, you yeah. can download his video, watch another game of him. The identifying could come through the data work. So you do, you know, we ton do tons of different data things. Some that are quite like specific to the club of what we want and some, you know, that more broad, you can identify players that way. But agents kind of touch all three processes because an agent could call you up and say, hey, there's a player who you might not think is available to you, but after they're my client, I've talked to the club, they could be potentially become available. You might want to look at them. So agents kind of fit in on the identifying stage that way. But then you come into the next stage, like the shortlisting, you kind of need them a little bit because you now need to know roughly what they're going to cost. You know, there's no point shortlisting a player, but yeah. you know, they're going to cost you 100 million pounds and you only have 50. Yeah. So you need to know that the relationship with the agents so you can kind of get, you know, what their expectations are, what the other club's expectations are. But often they don't match up, so you just take them off the list. And then the finalizing stage, the agents come in to kind of represent the player and negotiate to make sure that the, their client gets the best um, contract possible, basically. So let's say like now on the deadline day of the transfers now, when you agree to sign a player, what's the first thing you do? Like, do you deposit the money or how, how, how do you get to pay the money, the cash? So often I think people think it's kind of like United physically give 100 million to Juventus or Pogba. It, it's a little bit different. That. It's kind of more of like the agreement to give them 100 million. And often if it's the money's up front, what United would tend to do is they'll get like a, a bank or like a finance company who pretty much will just front the money, give it to Juventus and United will slowly pay back um, the bank. So that tends to be, there tends to be like a financial partner who kind of handle that side of things. Um, once you agree on the transfer, um, you kind of get like a, almost like a letter of like um, consent from the previous club to say that my player, we're going to relinquish his um, kind of registration right. Yeah. He's free to go to the other club. From, from the incoming clubs end, what you kind of do, it's, there's a lot of bureaucratic things, but little things that you just don't think about. Like you need to get insurance for the player. You know, you spend millions of pounds on a player and he gets injured first training session. What happens then? So you kind of, before you get them involved, you need to make sure they get their insurance. You make sure they get their visas if that applies to the player, if they're coming from abroad, visas are a yeah. big thing. Um, you know, then, you know, register them with, with the FA. And then it kind of all gets squared off between, you know, they're telling the league, we've released this player, he's going to to this club. And then we're telling the, the, the league, oh, we've 
brought in this player and we have registered him. And then they're free to to train and to play. So let's say you send the player now and you want him to play, let's say, like in like two days. How do you register him? Like, what's the process? Uh, so I'm not quite sure on like that's on on the exact bureaucracy of how like to like speed things up, but it's just pretty much they do have like a cutoff point. I think it's the previous day at lunchtime because they feel that they need to do like you know there's some. I think I kind of it was um, Everton kind of fell foul of that with Mope was they they had registered him on the Monday, but that was a bank holiday. There, there was no, it wasn't a working day. So that mm. they would have had to register him on the Friday. So it ended up being a bit of a mess and he ended up missing a fixture because of that. So there is okay. a lot of bureaucratic kind of, you know, side shows that goes on with it. And then there are lawyers involved that kind of know the rule book inside and out. And they kind of help you make sure that the paperwork is done in time. Um, I'm not sure the exact cut of, I think it is like the day before um, at lunchtime. Um, the work day before at lunchtime, I think, is the kind of is kind of the deadline for the next evening's fixtures. So when they say a team from the place like in Munich to negotiate with Thiago Alcantara, who are these people? Where exactly are these people going to do the negotiations now? Well, it, it it varies club to club, and I think the media kind of portray it as almost like this movie scene where like a few guys in suits board a plane and they go off to Munich, and it's yeah. not it's it's a bit more informal than that. There's a lot of phone calls, a lot of WhatsApps that go back and forth between. Uh, you know, club and club, club and agent, agent and club. And it kind of all kind of works informally a little bit. Then as it starts to heat up, you then get more of like intense, you know, negotiations of, okay, well, you know, putting actual numbers to things. A lot of, a lot of the discussions and you kind of hear like, you know, they're exploring or things like that. That's kind of just kind of getting a ballpark, you know, figure because you have to think a club only has so many number of employees. So yeah. they try to do as much work to kind of find a reason to rule out a transfer almost because you don't want to dedicate your scouts time to watching a player that you just can never afford. And whether you're the biggest club in the world or the smallest club in the world, there'll always be a player you want who you can't afford. You know, United, yeah. United Liverpool, Arsenal, they can't just go buy anyone they want. Yeah. You know, it's easy to go buy the expensive player. You know, if, if every club just was saying, okay, well, let's go buy the best, you know, Mbappe would have moved every season. But it's not realistic, right? You're going to always... So you you spend a lot of time figuring out if something's even possible. And if it's not, you just move on to the next one and the next one and the next one. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of how that kind of... They've, and the, the people, it tends to vary per club. Some clubs, they'll have the CEO negotiate things. Um, that's their kind of remit. Some clubs will have a head of recruitment who negotiates things. It just, it varies. Each club is kind of, depending on their own individual structure, um, will kind of work work towards it it's before it used to be the manager heavily involved but now managers are becoming um more head coaches and you know they'll more have the power to like veto a transfer for example to say well i don't want that player so let's not sign him but they'll be less involved in the actual like you know nitty-gritty of the negotiations okay so how do the former clubs now receive their cash let's say like now victor and yama moved from celtic from nairobi to celtic southampton to Tottenham now to canada how do this now? I know Celtic, I know City starts to receive some cash here in Nairobi. Like, how do you make sure now these clubs do receive that cash? Yeah, so I think that's something that's regulated through FIFA. Um, okay. I'm not quite sure on the exact mechanism, but from my understanding is you basically, um, as long as you register the person, the player, like officially and through the right channels and they're playing for you legally and all of that, yeah. it should be, you should feed that registration to your FA. The FA should feed that to FIFA and oh. essentially whenever a transfer happens they there's a mechanism within FIFA and a division within FIFA just to kind of align and make sure the solidarity payments do filter their way back down now I think the way I understand it is you you have to put a claim on that it's not something that just gets put in towards your account so FIFA might alert you that your former player X has moved clubs he could have been with you 10 years ago and you the staff has changed so you don't even know he played for you yeah. but there's a, I believe there's some sort of mechanism that allow. I'm not 100% sure on that. It's more of the lawyer's side of things. But they can, okay. you know, they can, you know, alert you to that and you can then put a claim on it and they'll investigate the claim and say, okay, yes, actually, this player was registered with you and there's some calculation, you know, pay, pay, pay them that amount. Okay, nice. So how do clubs pull out of the deal? Let's say like now you've agreed everything, you've done some interviews, but now at the end of it, now a club pulls out, like doesn't happen. 
Yeah, you know, it's it's the same as anything. You know, you're buying a house, you're buying a car. Nothing's done until it's done. Um, you know, you you can agree things, but until there's so many different bits of paperwork that need to be signed off, and I think until all of it's done, you know, you can never say a transfer is done. You know, anything can happen. You can have, you know, I think like the the big one people always kind of see is like failed medicals. Um, you know, you can agree this could be the perfect player, and then. You know, it, it comes in, medical doesn't work out until that final well, piece of paper is signed. It's 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 never done. So it's it's uh, about making sure you have all your ducks in the row and not don't celebrate something until it's until they're in the house in the, in the house. When you say someone's failed a medical, you know people don't understand. Like it's a broad term. Like like what exactly like happens when you say someone's failed his medical because he's been playing for this club, but now you're saying he's failed a medical at Liverpool or Chelsea or somewhere else. Yeah, so I think medicals aren't like prescribed things of X, Y, Z. You know, they have to tick all these boxes. Every club will have their own sort of internal understanding of what they want out of a player. Yeah. Um, so they'll kind of, and it even within that, I think there's a little bit of shift depending yeah. on the player coming in. And it's almost that understanding of it's not a pass or fail. It's more more information on the player to understand if they have, let's say, for example, they have an issue with their knee that, for the last five years of their career, never shown up. But now we can see, okay, you know, in fi- in a two or three years, it's going to degrade and we might not get the same performance out of him that we've got. Now, some clubs will say, well, we only need him for the one season to do well. It's it's great, whatever, we'll sign him. But some other clubs will say, well, we're actually looking at him as an investment. We want to sell him on. So for us, that's going to be a failed medical. So it, it, it really does, every club has their own kind of interpretation of the results and, their own allowance for risk you know that's what it ultimately is is everything we do from from scouting uh from scouts to the medical guys we're just trying to understand the player we're signing what's the risk with them and yes. some, some some players will do a medical and we think okay the risk is too high sometimes we'll do a medical and we'll say yeah the same thing is showing up but we feel the risk isn't too high so we'll, you'll, you'll do it so it just it kind of just it depends on the, on the okay so how do players handle the transfer request? Like we've seen like a couple of times a player has been said he's going to request to transfer out. How do you do that as a player? So it's one of those things where it's like there's the formal and there's the informal. I think the, the correct way of doing it, I think, is to, you know, call up your manager and say, oh, you know what, like for X, Y reason, I'm, I'm quite keen to make to, to move on and, you know, then, you know, kind of maybe put something in writing writing behind that. I think often the informal side kind of happens a lot more than necessarily the formal side. Um, but it's just kind of making it known that your preference would be for a transfer to happen. Um, that, you know, if, you know, if the relationship is good between player and club, often, you know, the player will just come tell the manager himself. Maybe it's a bit more distant or if he wants to kind of put a, a bit of a break between him, he'll have his agent, you know, call up and say, you know, actually kind of, keen on the player to move it's not i think a lot of stuff that's kind of like in the media you think of it more as like a much more formal process than it is i think we just have to realize a lot of you know we are co-workers we work in you know effectively you know the players are my co-workers there we're in the same office quote unquote so we do yes. have relationships and i think it's just kind of the same way you'd handle it at work if you yeah. had something you know you wanted to do it's, you you just go talk to your to your boss they have a little bit more because they have someone who can talk to their boss for them in an agent, but oftentimes it's the informal, just like, look, it's time for me to move on. There's there's a deal potentially that I could go for. I would really appreciate it if I can make a move. And then hopefully the clubs, you know, we can all come to an, uh, a fair agreement for every player. You know, it it's never nice if there's a transfer. I can, you know, if there's a transfer done that people aren't happy with, but I think oftentimes everyone's happy for each other that the club got a fair deal, the player got a fair deal, and everyone kind of moves together. Yeah. Finally, Nate Dunn, what happens to players who have no agents? It's 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 quite rare. Um, I personally, if I was, you know, if I was, let's let's add, add, a, add a son or daughter who is a professional, I would want them to have an agent. I think an agent, I think agents are useful from the player's point of view because they, you know, that agents, I think, I, I appreciate agents because they, they do help facilitate a lot of things. They do kind of turns our eyes you know they turn scouts eyes towards things they make sure the players are represented well i think it's it's difficult i think you have to be um very um comfortable with where you are as a as a player like i think if you're at a club and you say i want to be here forever and they they're all gonna have to drag me out of this building 
then we can maybe get away with not having an agent. But I think when the times come to negotiate a contract, it's good to have an agent because that agent will know what the rest of the market looks like. You know, it's yeah. you're not going to know if you're, let's say you play for, for Manchester United, you might not know what the player who's performed exactly the same as you in your position at Chelsea is earning. And come contract time, if United offer you 30 grand less um, than, Ch than Chelsea would is offering their player, if you don't know that, you're getting a bad deal. So it's, I think it's really important. I, you know, I, I, they get a bad rep, but I think their overall, they, they, they do help. They do help the process. Final one, final one. How many ex do you think a club like Chelsea have? Um, it's, 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 it's tough to say. I think they, they have, you know, they have quite a lot. They're probably close to hundred kind of spread in across the age. What? Across, close to? I think probably close to hundred. I'm, I'm not too sure. I can't, I can't really go. It depends. It just depends. You know, some clubs okay. are, you know, the thing is, I think what's, what's the kind of like behind the scenes, I think a little bit politics is yeah. there's, you know, there, there, are ton, there can be tons of scouts at a club, but it's, I think it's important to make sure that the decision makers and the like key personnel who are really looking through reports and really kind of making decisions. I personally think having a smaller team that does that is better than having a large team that, you know, it's good to have a large team to cover as much ground as possible. There's always more games you can watch. There's always more work you can do on a player. I think having a large base for that is great. But I think as long as the key decision makers are a small team of trusted, you know, people that's probably the best way of, of doing it so they have you know you know they have the resources to do things like that and cover cover players across the globe um i think we you know speak a little bit off we 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 don't have as big a team as them but i think we do quite a good job covering the areas in which we do yeah yeah ah, nice thanks i think that's it for now and thanks a lot